So as our next speaker, we have Anoop MD, the creator of Bruno, an open source ID for exploring and testing APIs and the Brew markup language. Its standout features includes offline functionality, Git collaboration, and file system-based collection storage. Within just a week, the past week, they have had a remarkable surge of GitHub stars, which was like 3K. And actually, Bruno is making waves. So please give a huge round of applause for Anoop, who is going to share his insights about the roadmap and the architecture of the Bruno. Check. I think this is. Just take a moment. I will start. Students, engineers, and open source enthusiasts, welcome to Bruno, the API client of the future. Hello, I'm Anoop. I'm the creator of Bruno. Um, I have a day job as a tech lead at Better Place. I'm also the co-founder of a company called Salonify. We make software for salons and spas. So what is Bruno, right? Uh, Bruno is an IDE for exploring and testing APIs. We are an open source project. We store your collections as files. We use Git for collaboration. You can use Git. And the software is fully offline, meaning there is no server component in Bruno. And there is no plans for Cloud Sync at all. Now, if you, if we have a stall there. You see all the uh, t-shirts. We have swag, we have cups, mugs. We have a standee, we have stickers. You might actually think that we are a company, or you know, uh, we are VC funded and a uh, company who are presenting it here. No. We are actually a, p a group of passionate individuals who want to solve, who want to build the API client that developers love. Now let me show you a quick demo, and then we'll get into more about the architecture details and more things. Right? So time for a quick demo. So I'm going to bring up Bruno here. So I already have a Bruno test bench. It's a test repository. What's unique about Bruno, and disclaimer, you, most of you have used Postman and Insomnia. Bruno is an upcoming evolution on top of what clients that exist today. Right? Now I'm going to show you how we create a collection in Bruno. So I'm going to create a collection. I'm going to call this a test collection. right? And I'm going to choose the location as the desktop. And I'm going to give the folder name as test. Now I have a test collection here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this up in VS Code. I'm going to open the folder. Let's go to the test collection that we just created in desktop. OK, so actually, there's nothing in the test folder. It's just a bruno.json file. Now, what I'll do is I'll go back to Bruno, and I'll quickly create a request. I'm just going to create a new request. Um, OK, so there we have a simple ping request. All right, so we were able to get a ping request working. And now if you look here, it created a file, called a brew file, which is called as ping.brew. Now, all the request details, which includes, I'm not going to go do a full demo, your headers, your authentication, your scripts, everything resides in this, in this file. Now, that actually applies to folders. So if you actually think about it, if I look at this big collection here you have, you have auth, you have uh, a bearer, and you want to do something with uh, maybe, you know, you want to do bearer or basic authentication with scripts. All of this is mirrored as a set of folders and files. So I'm just going to add the, uh, the collection that we are seeing. So let me just go to Bruno's test bench. That's our test bench collection. Um, so here we have this collection, and you have here auth, you have here, let's say, basic. 
and you have it via script, and you have a script that runs this, right? So this is the thing that separates Bruno from existing clients like Postman and Insomnia, right? We save your collection, your folders and requests as a set of folders and files in Bruno. Now, I would not be here if something crazy didn't happen on September 28th, right? I've been working on this project for two years. And it took us two years to go from zero to 500. And then in the next 10 days, we went from 500 to 5,000. And then today, we are at 7,000 GitHub stars. Right? <laughs> now, what changed? When I built Bruno for two years, for the first year was fully on development. And we had the product in January itself, in the beginning of the year. I used to go to conferences, I used to go to people, I used to go to companies, talk to people, and, and ask, tell them, look at this, this is a different paradigm. But we hadn't get, gotten the visibility, and today we have it. It's not just the GitHub stars. For, the, for 23 months, every month, we had close to just 200 to 300 people who would try out our platform. This month, in October, we have 20,000 people who use Bruno today. Let's talk about API cycles, or API clients, right? This is a typical playbook. Postman is the original gangster, the OG of API client, who started this journey in 2015. After that, every API client that comes out, Insomnia and everything else that has come out, follows this playbook. You launch an API client, you have user growth, you have crazy GitHub stars, naturally, then you have VC funding, then you have cloud collaboration. You start supporting, you know, you want to take your API collections and collaborate it on cloud. You have team sync. And then finally, you want to make money off your API client. You deprecate your scratch pad. You delete your scratch pad. And you make everybody start using cloud account. That's what happened on September 28th. The two major players, Insomnia and Postman, they forced their users to say that it's going to be cloud or nothing else. And developer got, they got pissed off. And that's when they started actually looking is there something that's better out there? And that's when God, Bruno got the visibility. And usually, the last part, bloat is one of the things that we've seen in every API client out there. Now I'd like to get to the, uh, the tech stack. Bruno's UI is built on React.js. We use Next.js, we use Tailwind for our CSS styling. Redux for our state management. We use Electron. Electron typically gets a bad stereotype, seeing that it's bulky or it's, it's too spacious. This is actually a stereotype spread by Electron monsters like Microsoft Teams and Slack and Postman. Right? They don't put the necessary effort to use Electron and optimize it, just like how Microsoft has done it for VS Code. VS Code is the top most editor that's used in the world, and it runs on Electron. Right? Electron is actually a really great framework. It's what enabled Bruno. We have tabular icons. Shout out to the tabular icons, guys. They have a really wonderful set of uh, icons. We use Axios for requests, and we use this library called Chokidar, which does the file system thing. So as I told you, Bruno saves things on your file, right? I didn't show you one demo, which is that it's not just one direction. You just don't save it to your files. Anytime I make a change in the file, it reflects back in Bruno. So you can think of, like, VS Code is an editor, right? Anytime you make a change in VS Code, that change is getting reflected on your file system, right? Bruno is a visual editor, right? It's still an editor. It's a visual editor where your collections are stored inside your file system. Let's get into some architecture bits of Bruno. So front-end developers would know it. This is how a typical Redux managed state management looks like. You have a view, right? And any time a view wants to change, you want to toggle a button or anything, you dispatch an action, right? The action gets picked up by the reducer. The reducer takes your old state, reduces it to a new state, and puts it back in the store. And your view just reflects the store. The view can never directly impact the store. It has to go through this loop. That's why we call it React. React means it reacts just to the view. I'm sorry, to the store. It's always a representation of the store. You want to change the view, you change the store, and the direction flows. We use Redux in Bruno for state management, but there are actually two state managements in Bruno. One is the state management, let's say, when you make a request, or which tabs are opened in Bruno, right? A lot of these things go with Redux state management. But I want to talk about state management from a file system, right? 
in this demo, I just showed you, I created a new request called thing, right? What React did is that it never updated the Redux store. It actually sends you an event on the Electron layer, which is the IPC listener. Electron listens to React, saying that it wants to create a file. We create that file, we write to the file system. That file goes into the file system. Then you have the watcher, which is the Chokidar library. That sits in Electron. It is continuously monitoring your folder. And it reads your folder that a new file got created. And that goes to React. And React renders it. So it's the same Redux model. In Redux, you had a store which was in memory. In Bruno, the file system is the store. It is the state where your collections reside. Anytime your file changes, Bruno reflects it. Let's move on to DSL abstraction. Um, so you have, in Bruno, you have the app. We have the brew file. I'm slightly running out of time, so I'm going to move this a bit faster. The, the brew language, the request gets stored in brew language, but I want you to know that the app or the electron layer, the entire code base has no clue about what the brew language is. There is a tiny parser that sits, five files that sit, that converts when you write and when you read. It takes the brew, it takes a JSON structure, which is the internal DSL, it takes it and puts it into the file system. And when there is a brew file, it reads it and sends it back to Electron. And Electron and App, they have no clue about what brew is. So in version two, we are going to not just support brew language, we are going to support, you can save your things if you want in JSON or in YAML or in TOML, which is another language. Scripting powers, this is something that's there in no other API client. Uh, they, they do have scripting, but the power at which Bruno supports scripting is nothing like out there. You can install any NPM package, any NPM package of your choice. You can organize in your collection, just like how you take code, you create a lib folder or a tools folder. You put your common logic in the tools folder. You use your VS Code editor to edit it and then import it inside your collection script. This level of support is not there in any client out there and this is only possible because of our architecture and our local first approach. Now, I also want to talk about simplicity. Simplicity, if you look at Bruno, it's just, it's just simple. There's no blow You don't see a login button there. You'll never see a login button there. You will never see a collection network button. You will never see a documentation, API governance, monitoring, whatnot. You will just see what is needed. So Bruno is simple. And when we talk about simplicity, we are not talking about simplicity for the sake of simplicity. We're talking about simplicity because that is all that is needed for 99% of developers who use an API client. Now, we are in the, we are in the innovative stage at this point, 20,000 users. We have a lot, a lot of students. You wouldn't need anything other than Bruno. A lot of teams today, production teams, wouldn't need anything more than Bruno to run your teams. And there are people and there are individuals and teams who say that we like Bruno, we love Bruno, but this feature is not there. And they love Bruno so much that they take the code base, it's open source, they create pull requests for the feature that they want, and they raise it. And in October, we've received over 100 pull requests to make Bruno better. And I've already merged more than 70, 80% of them, and there are still 50 PRs left on our GitHub tracker, ready to merge. Chain reaction. We feel that we are nearing critical mass for a chain reaction to happen. We have 20,000 users who are using Bruno. This we call network effect the term that VCs crave, VCs love. The next six months are going to be crucial. We have a hypothesis. Our open source, file-based, Git-friendly, fully offline, zero cloud sync, API clients, the future. That's a hypothesis. That's a question we have to, we'll see in the answer for it in six months. We believe it is the future. If it were not, I would not have worked for this, on this app for two years. And if this prediction comes true, we will be the de facto choice of API client for developers. Now, Bruno, the name behind Bruno, right? Initially, the project was called GraphNode, right? That was a code name for the product. But I watched, uh, I, I was getting into Git, I was getting, learning a lot of Git internals, and I watched this beautiful talk by Linus Torvalds, uh, 2006, Google Talk, you should go watch it, uh, where he told that he named Linus, Linux after himself. He named Git after himself. That, that was cool. And then I learned that MySQL and MariaDB 
I, for all my life, thought that my sequel means my sequel, my sequel, mine. But then I learned that actually it's the name of the daughter. My and Maria are the names of the daughter. That just touched me. That you, you, a, a creator honored his daughters. So as product creators, we go behind these crazy names, stupid names. We, 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 we forget to look around in our family and name it on honor of somebody. So I looked around and I found a special person deserving of that name. I'm excited, elated to introduce to you the prince who will be fetching your APIs. Meet Bruno. You see the logo, the name, and the face? That's what the logo stands for. Now, talking about, this is my final slide, talking about release v1.0.0. After we had this 20,000 users, a lot of us, a lot of them reached out to me and told that it's time to call this 1.0.0 because it has already what they want. A lot of teams don't need to go beyond what we already have in Bruno. I wanted to complete a lot more things before we launch 1.0.0, but the community said that it's already 1.0.0. Why don't you take whatever you want to do and do it later as a part of 2.0? Let's call this 1.0.0. There's a GitHub issue there, and I decided, yes, 1.0 does not mean that all features are there. 1.0 means that this is production ready for teams to use it. What better place to launch 1.0 than on these grounds of India Fast 3.0. What better time to do that in front of you all, other than in front of you all. So we're going to launch that right here, right now. Two years in the making. This is the time. That brings me to the conclusion of this talk. Thank you so much. I think I've used the time, but is there time? There's no time, right? You have, you have any one question? You have time? Uh, are there people, any questions at all? Open source, monetization, VC funding, anything at all that you want to ask? Uh, so yeah, along those lines, uh, so how do you plan to sustain this essentially going out into the future? Yes, so sustainability is very important, right? We all want to put, we don't want to do free work, right? We, we all are here, we work, we want to put food on the table for our families. So the sustainability plan is that we don't want to go to VC funding. At least I strongly feel that an API client need not have VC funding. When you get VC funding, you don't actually get it for the API client itself. You actually get to go and build out bigger things, right? But in API client itself, it doesn't need VC funding. In terms of sustainability and making sure that there is enough incentives for a creator, we plan to have a professional um, uh, golden edition plan where we are trying to find the right balance which works for the community and for the creators. Right? And at this point, there is a pricing page. You can go look at it. What we have decided is that REST and GraphQL APIs, which are needed for 80 to 90% of the world, they run on REST and GraphQL APIs. This includes scriptings, everything. There's no actually some backdoors or something. Everything that's needed, REST and GraphQL APIs will be free. It will be, the community will build it. I will continue to maintain it and steer the project. And things like gRPC and WebSockets and a bunch of niche things, some small things, we'll try to uh, have a paid edition for it at an affordable edition. And we actually want to make this model work because open source has suffered from this lack of monetization. And it's very hard to do in libraries. It's very hard. But at least with desktop apps, there's a possibility of offering a paid edition. And we want Bruno to be a shining light in that area where, as a creator, you can actually build really good software and still 
somehow have a sustainable, sustainable uh, part built into it. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? The person there has a question. You have a question? No. Anybody else? OK, so thank you so much. We are here to build the most beautiful, simple API client that developers love. We just want to build a simple, beautiful curl. And I hope you join us in the journey. And we have a stall there, so if you want to come around, chat with us, talk about anything and everything, please come to, come to our stall. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anup, for sharing your story about Bruno.